Okay, well, hopefully you watched the, the uh, video and you learned that they were quantifying distractibility based on the attractiveness of the, I don't know what you call the figures that were walking, based on the attractiveness of the walking style of these different figures, how much did the person's attention get pulled by an attractive figure in their peripheral vision? Um, so distract, it was a measure of distractibility. Now, is it a perfect all encompassing measure of distractibility? No, they've defined one aspect of a component of love, attraction. And they've said, well, this would be one way to tell whether a person's attention gets pulled by an attractive figure walking. Um, so it's not all encompassing. That isn't the point of operationism. We need to have observable, measurable, and independently verifiable um, assessments of aspects of the overall concept. So distractibility, that's one possible definition of love. What about arousal? In psychological research, there was a study where um, they had two bridges. One is the bridge that you see in this picture. And as you can tell, it's a suspension bridge up uh, above a high gorge. It's up in British Columbia. Um, and then the other bridge in the study was the, the driving bridge that's over the same gorge, but it, you know, cars drive across it. And so it's very stable. And they had a, an attractive research assistant, female, uh, greet males who were walking by themselves across the bridge and ask them to participate in a little study where they were supposed to um, tell a little story about a picture that she showed them that has a male and a female in the picture. And um, so it's like a little sort of cover activity. Um, on, and then at the end of it, after, after the uh, participant was done writing their little story, then the, research is, the researcher gave the guy her phone number and said, if you have any questions, please feel free to call me. Here's my name. Here's my phone number. And what they found is that the, the men were much more likely to call the research assistant if they met her on that suspension bridge than they were if they met her walking across the sturdy bridge. And interestingly, they told more um, romantic, I guess, is the word that we want to say, stories about the picture that she showed them when they were on the on the suspension bridge than they did on the driving bridge. So it one argument, one interpretation was that when you're kind of scared, we call it arousal, right? Your heart rate's up, um, things like that. And a lot of times you will look around in your environment and say, why am I feeling like this? Now, of course, the obvious explanation would be I'm feeling like this because I'm on a suspension bridge. But if I could say, oh, it's because this attractive woman is giving me her phone number, it might make us feel attracted, attraction instead of just fear, right? And they found evidence for that in the stories that the, per that the men wrote and also in the fact that they were more likely to call her for more details is the cover story, right? But they were more likely to call her um, if they had met her on the rickety bridge. So again, is that an all encompassing theory of attraction? Well, no, um, it's just one little part. And that's the beauty of science is that we only need to be each of us sort of studying our own little operationism based, um, very concrete, very observable, very independently verifiable part of each topic. Uh, what about eye gazing? There was a really clever study where they had, uh, they recruited men and women who were heterosexual into a study and they were, they didn't know each other, but they were randomly placed into partnerships. This is obviously, I just found this picture on the internet. So they did, they did not get this close to their partner in the study, but uh, they had, um, had the males and females sit across each other from each other in little partnerships. Um, and half of the partnerships were told, um, to gaze into each other's eyes to try and get into ESP alignment with each other because later we're going to be doing a little ESP test. And so they were told stare into each other's eyes and um, the other half of the participants were told stare at each other's hands. So they weren't looking in each other's eyes. 
Um, after it was over, there really was no ESP test. Instead, they did a, they went into their own room after that by themselves and they filled out a questionnaire. And some of the um, questions pertain to how attractive the individual thought that their partner was. And what they found is that in the par partnerships where they gazed into each other's eyes, the rating of the attractiveness of their partner was higher than in the, in the pairs where they gazed at each other's hands. So this idea of sort of getting into an alignment corresponds to things that we typically do when we're attracted to somebody, right? We gaze into other people, into the other person's eyes when we're attracted to them. Um, so the, the hypothesis was if we gaze when we are attractive, will gazing make us attracted? And th this study kind of suggested it will, right? The act of eye gazing makes us more attracted. So is this all encompassing? Absolutely not. It's one little thing that making eye contact makes us feel more attracted to somebody. Now it's always important to do our eye contact in proper doses. If you're going to make friends, Larry, you must learn that there is a fine, just a fine line between eye contact and the piercing stare of a psychopath, <laughs> right? Um, so eye contact in proper doses can indicate attraction, right? Or interest. And it can make us respond with attraction or interest. Um, my last example of love, what is it? Some researchers have used measures of commitment as um, their stand in for love. So if a couple has gotten married, if a couple stays married for a long time, they'll look at that as a uh, one measure of how much love they're experiencing. Now, of course, this is a faulty also. It's not all all encompassing for one thing, because there are different kinds of commitments besides marriage. Um, but it's also faulty in the sense that sometimes people get married and don't stay married. So I gave you a picture of Jennifer Aniston and Brad Pitt because obviously they didn't stay married. Um, right. So you don't always stay married. And then even in the couples who do stay married, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're doing it because they have love for their partner. It might be for other reasons. Right. Um, so we're not trying with any of these individual studies or approaches to explain all aspects of love in any of them. What we're doing is measuring little parts that, across lots of different studies might give us an overall picture for, um, you know, what this concept of love really is. Man, I am noticing that every noisemaker is occurring all at one time now. I've got my, my email thing is going off on my other computer. My hoot owl, because it's noon, is going off on my clock. <laughs> like, could everything be going at the same time? <sighs> anyway, sorry. I apologize. I told you guys I'm not a YouTuber. I did get a better... I did get a better microphone, but my gosh, could you stop making noise? My other computer. So operationism relies on operational definitions, operational definitions. So I listed all the operational definitions that we've got on basically the different um, studies that I reported on that last slide, right? Distractibility. Did you shift your eyes or not? Um, arouse. Actually, you know what? Did you shift your eyes? Could be one measure. The, the video that you watched, he wasn't actually measuring whether they shifted their eyes. He was measuring that they must have shifted their eyes because they didn't do as well on that task where they were supposed to be recognizing the T. Um, so they had to have shifted their eyes for them not to have been able to notice the T, right? Um, so sometimes we don't even really look at what it seems like we're looking at in order to measure these things. Um, arousal. Now, the, in the study I reported to you, it was, um, you know, whether the, the man called the woman afterwards. It was what kind of story the man wrote about the picture. But we could also just directly measure arousal through heart rate, right? Like if the person's excited by the by the other person, their heart rate would probably go up. So that's, you know, a really concrete way that we could measure it. You know, eye gazing is the person making eye contact, you know, um, commitment. We could say, did they get married? Did they stay married? So these are all just sort of like different operational definitions that we could use for all these topics that I listed on the last slide. The key thing in an, it, the key thing in an operational definition is that we're going to define the concepts by how they will be measured. So we don't say love is, and we explain fully what love is. Instead, we say in this study, we will define love as heart rate uh, increases when gazing at the person's partner, a picture of the person's partner, something like that. So I haven't fully defined love. Instead, I've said, this is what I mean by love in this study, right? So we're going to talk about the concepts just by um, through how we're measuring those concepts. 
So it may not be a full definition. And, you know, if you read my study where I let people look at pictures of their romantic partner, or I had them look at pictures of hippopotamuses or something, um, and we see that heart rate accelerates more in the face of, uh, you know, looking at your romantic partner than it does when looking at hippopotamuses. I may argue that, you know, when we see our love object, our heart rate accelerates. Um, and you might say, well, that doesn't even remotely approach my definition of love. Like that, that's not really that meaningful. That's okay. You can do your study and you can use whatever measure you want. And that's the beauty is that different scientists use different operational definitions. And then across the field of the literature, we start to get a pattern for what it means to be attracted or to be in love or whatever. Um, the key thing is we want to signal to other researchers how we define the concept in the current study so that they are aware that, you know, while in their head, they might be thinking that love means that you want to get married. In my head, when I was doing the study, I meant love was your heart rate accelerates when you see your love object, right? So we have like, we got to make sure that we're, we're defining things the same way or that you're getting into my head and understanding what I meant by it. So that when you get in, when you do your own study, you're not thinking, oh, look, I'm doing a complete replication and I'm measuring attraction by commitment. Well, you didn't do a complete replication because I did heart rate, right? So we want to just make sure that researchers are on the same page. Um, and then also readers are on the same page so that, for example, when you're doing your APA paper and you're going through all the literature on your topic, um, you're going to be able to tell what the different researchers meant by the concept um, at, by virtue of how they measured that concept. So these operational definitions are really informative and useful so that we all know what everybody's talking about. Keeping in mind that most most of the things that we're studying in psychology are um, constructs. They're, co they're complex concepts that we're probably only going to be able to study little aspects of it, and not the full definition. All right. Um, so let's make a little bit of an abrupt shift and talk about how uh, things differ when we're sort of taking information on faith versus if we're using science to internalize information. I put a little asterisk down there because when I say faith, I'm not talking about religious faith. I'm talking about, for example, um, some researcher who's famous in the area has said X and we go, well, that person's really famous. I'm sure they know what they're talking about. I believe them. Or maybe we found something on the internet that really caught our attention and we're like, you know what? I'm going to, I believe this. This makes sense to me. I'm going to take it on faith and I'm not going to do any scientific um, questioning or something like that. So that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about objective things that could be measured, but we're, instead we're choosing to take them on faith. One of the things that makes it more likely that we'll take an argument on faith is uh, the strength of the conviction that the person who's reporting it has. I've had students say that um, it's hard to trust the scientific scholarly reports because they don't really um, sound that passionate when they're just describing their outcomes. They're just sort of, you know, it appears that with these participants, given these stimuli, that this is, this actually helps. And it's like, shouldn't you sound more enthusiastic about this? And the truth is the strength of the conviction increases credibility when we're taking stuff, something on faith. Um, that's, you know, if a person's really passionate, um, it makes it seem like they know what they're talking about more when we're, when we're taking information on faith, when we're taking information on faith, if somebody else criticizes the thing that we're believing, we're like, who are you to, com to criticize? You know, I've got this famous person or this person who's really passionate about it. You don't know anything about it. I used sort of faith-based words there, heresy, right? Um, because it's like an affront to a person who's taking information on faith that, you know, I can't even begin to explain to you all the ways in which you don't understand, right? Um, you, you see this a lot on social media as people will um, state their um, information that they're taking on faith and somebody else will question it. And then the first person will be like, I don't even know if I can explain this to you, you know, like kind of implying you're too dumb to really understand it. Um, they're, they're kind of affronted. They're kind of offended that you would criticize this thing that they believe and that they know is true. Like it has to be true. The person who reported this information was so passionate and they, you know, seem to know what they're talking about. And they were so invested and they told me all the ways in which they know this, you know, like they read this study and, um, it's, you know, 
I'm thinking of a, a, a particular case and I'm trying not to say the details of it because I'm thinking of a particular case um, where people will say, well, but my friend has this training that makes them actually an expert on this issue. And so that's why I'm believing it. And it's like, okay, um, your friend who's an expert might not know everything about it. And have they really like weighed the evidence or is this just their interpretation, right? With people who are taking information by faith, um, contrary evidence doesn't really affect their beliefs. In fact, uh, it causes them to search around to find more evidence that they're right. So it sort of fuels their comfort by confirmation bias impulses. Well, if you've provided contradictory Im Im evidence, I need to go find more data points that will support what I believe so that maybe I can convince you, right? So um, it doesn't make them say, oh my gosh, maybe I've interpreted this wrong. It makes them say, I just obviously haven't said it right yet. Let me go find more information. With science, it doesn't matter how passionate or how strongly convicted the, the scientist is. That doesn't, that has nothing to do with their cre credibility in science. Um, in science, we really want people to criticize our technique or our methodology or our interpretation. Um, we want to see other people testing our claims themselves. You know, we want to see replications. It's hugely flattering to see other people cite your research and say that they tested some aspect of what you did. It's really, it's actually really super flattering. Um, we like seeing other people take it one step forward, right? Improve on what we studied. So in science, we're like, right on. You know, this is going to like other people think this is interesting too. That's the thing I always feel like, because sometimes when I do research, I'm like, I'm the only person who cares about this. And, and then to see other people cite my work and, and realize that other people are, are interested in this also and that they want to, they want to test it, or maybe they even criticized what my conclusion was. That's okay. I want to hear what other people are finding or other ways that they're thinking about it. It may help to inform a study I want to do in the future, right? So in science, we welcome the criticism. And then when we have a piling up of contrary evidence, it starts to undermine the ultimate theory, right? We are looking for evidence that will undermine the theory. If we fail to find it, we say, oh, the theory seems to be working so far. But if we, you know, find evidence that undermines the theory, it's actually kind of fun. You know what I mean? Because our policy is to, uh, you know, look for falsification. So when we see that maybe a lot of people all seem to be embracing this one theory and approaching it in a certain way, it's kind of fun to be the rogue scientist who goes, okay, hold on, let's see if I can find the opposite or let's see if, you know, this actually is the most, you know, likely pattern. Like we want to seek out contrary evidence um, and possibly change the theory as a result of it. So when we talk about taking something on faith, we really sort of don't want to put it through falsification tests right? We display a lot of confirmation bias. Um, we maybe are displaying like the, the way of knowing called tenacity, right? Like we're going to stubbornly cling to what we've always known. Um, and maybe that tenacity is based on that authority figure who really just swept us away with their passion and their enthusiasm. Whereas in science, it doesn't matter who reports it or who, you know, what their style is. Um, what really matters is the, um, the methodology and the credibility of the actual data. So it's sort of, you know, two different ways of approaching the same thing. Now, scientific explanations are temporary. I've already addressed this before, and I just really want to drive home the idea that there are reasons why scientists talk in such, you know, sort of careful tones. Um, we say this data suggests rather than this data proves, right? We don't say things like that uh, because we know that our explanation may be overturned in the future that our explanations are temporary. So I thought I'd take us through a lovely history of one aspect of psychology, and that is the um, effort to explain how the brain actually causes behaviors or language or other kinds of things, like how the brain actually manifests itself in observable outcomes. So we'll go back into the early 1800s and talk about phrenology. Now this was technically not a science. It was a pseudoscience, but let's just pretend like they, because in phrenology, it sort of asked some questions that later became neuroscience because the thing that phrenologists were doing was arguing that, um, little areas of your brain, if they're really well developed, that'll cause certain characteristics in your behavior, your personality, um, you know, the likelihood that you are a thief, 
um, you know, if you have musical ability or not, like different little areas of your brain determine these outcomes according to phrenology. And now it starts getting really weird because they say um, that if that, if you have a really big area, it'll cause a bump on your skull over that area. And so we could actually um, give you sort of a personality or talent profile based on an exploration of the bumps on your head. So now you know why it's a pseudoscience because yeah, that doesn't work. But the idea that regions of your brain might have very specific functions, right? And then manifest themselves as very specific behavioral outcomes is actually a really good question that phrenologists were addressing. Came to the wrong conclusion, but good idea. So that was like the early 1800s. Um, as the 1800s went on, we started to have some observations of people who had damage to their brain and had then changes in their personality or behavior. This is a, a picture of Phineas Gage's skull. And he, in like 1830 or something like that, had a, uh, he was working on the railroad. So I might have my years off. I'm not a historian, but I know it was a long time ago. He was working on the railroad and uh, they were blasting, you know, a tunnel. And so the um, workers were taking one of these, what they call a tamping rod, which is what you see going through his skull, a long metal rod and, the, rod, and they tamped down the, um, the, powder into the hole that then they would ignite and it would explode. And so there was an accident where the explosion happened as a function of the tamping rod, tamping it down. Right. And so the, um, uh, when it exploded, it shot the, t the tamping rod out of the people's hands and it actually went through Phineas Gage from his cheekbone on his left side up through the top of his head. And it shot all the way through like this picture with the tamping rod in it, that it wasn't how he was. It shot through there and he lived and um, miraculously because I mean, it went right through his head and we think it probably severed his nerves that join his limbic system to his frontal lobe because one of the changes in his personality was that he became very emotional after the accident. Like it was easy to make him really super angry or make him cry. And um, when you don't have those connections between the limbic system and the frontal lobe, the frontal lobe can't sort of tamp down those limbic system responses. And so he gets really emotional, right? So he also had some damage to his motor strip because he had a limp and weakness on his left side for the rest of his life. We now know exactly what parts of his brain were affected, but um, back then they were sort of guessing that the parts of the brain that got damaged must control these these outcomes. They didn't really know, but they were kind of guessing. And that's what a lot of observations were about. Um, where you have a person who has some kind of physical damage and then there are changes in their behavior or personality. And we say, well, it must have been that that part of the brain governs those outcomes. Dissections of the brain um, gave us a little bit more detail in the um, early 1900s, maybe late 1800s. Um, there was a case that Paul Broca worked with, who um, was a guy that they called Ta in the nursing home, um, where he had what appeared to be a stroke. And then from then on, the only thing he could say was Ta. Um, after he died, they preserved his brain and they examined, you know, areas and they discovered what is now called Broca's area had been damaged in the stroke for him. And so when we look at brains postmortem and we see, you know, issues, damage, um, you know, dead areas, things like that, we then try and link it back to the behavioral changes that we observed when the person was alive and kind of start guessing, okay, this must have been the reason why they were doing that behavior, right? So dissections, but of course it's postmortem. So after the person dies, now we're, we see what their brain looks like and now we try and explain the behaviors. In the 1950s, um, a guy named Wilder Penfield started doing um, neurosurgery and this is actually one of his patients' brains while they're undergoing surgery. And um, so he was really curious about what different regions of the brain did. So when he, when he would uh, do brain surgery, he would keep his patients awake. Um, and then he would use a little electrical probe to activate different parts of their exposed parts of their brain. And um, he developed hypotheses about what these areas of the brain must do based on what responses they would produce when he electrically stimulated those parts. Like for example, one woman, he had a temporal lobe um, 
tumor that he was going to excise. And so while he was in there, he went ahead and, and stimulated areas of the temporal lobe. And she would say, oh, I hear bells or, oh, I hear a song. And he would say, can you sing the song? And she could, she'd sing the song. Um, so he came to the conclusion that that part of the temporal lobe was the storehouse for memory. Um, he was wrong. That's not the storehouse for memory. But what he might have been activating is the part of the temporal lobe that um, generates musical recollections, like things that have to do with sound. So at the time, he thought he had found the location of memory structures. But what he had probably found was like part of the interconnection that ultimately feeds into memory. Um, Today, we use PET scans, MRIs. This is a picture of an fMRI um, to try and uh, really narrow down what parts of the brain are active during different activities. And the really big pro of both the electrical stimulation studies and then the PET MRIs and the fMRIs is that the person's still alive. They're responsive. We can, um, in the case, we can stimulate them, uh, you know, auditorily. We could say to them, tell me what you're seeing, tell me what you're hearing. Um, you know, so that we can get like more feedback. So we're, we're getting better at figuring out um, what part of the brain does what. But here's the important thing. The uh, we still don't exactly know. For example, you see all these areas in this fMRI that are what we call lit up. Um, so the gray, the blue areas are not as active as the red, orange, yellow areas are. But we could argue that these parts of the brain are probably involved in whatever task the person is doing while they're in the fMRI machine. But there's a lot of activity going on in the brain all the time and things are interconnected. And so we're not exactly sure still what parts of the brain do what, uh, but we're getting better and better. And so our explanations are getting more specific, right? So we know for sure that phrenology was wrong now. We are starting to get better and better at being able to say, well, what must have happened to Phineas Gage? Because now that we know what structures do what from fMRIs, we can say that probably this is the part of the brain that he was, uh, that had been damaged. So we could add in motor strip and other things. Um, the key thing is that, you know, with the increase in technology, we've gotten better and better. But it's not just technology. It's like different researchers asking slightly different questions that has allowed us to improve and get better. So a lot of times students, when they hear this whole lecture that I gave, where we're watching us get more and more technologically advanced through this, you know, history, um, they focus in on the technology, but don't forget different researchers were asking different questions. And that's really super important to science that new eyes, you know, new hypotheses help us to move forward step by step in science. And so we may, this may be our level of understanding right now, and in 15 years, we might have new information that shows us that our previous explanation was incomplete or maybe even incorrect. Um, so that's the important thing to remember about, you know, scientific explanations being temporary. All right, I'm going to go ahead and break here and we will finish up this chapter with reliability and validity.